Thank you very much, Fern, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be here this morning and to have an excuse to visit Tacoma, which uh, somehow I've managed to miss all these years. I'm not sure why. Um, let me just apologize in advance. I, I have a lingering cough, and I'm going to do my best to talk through it, but uh, don't be alarmed if it catches me once or twice. Um, I was very intrigued when I was first contacted by Fern by the, the theme of this conference. Uh, I think it is an extremely interesting and timely one. And I focused in particular in, in preparing these remarks on the word beyond, because I think that really is what this is all about. Um, I'm going to start with a, a wonderful book by the Italian author Italo Calvino, written in 1972, called Invisible Cities. And this is a book of short stories about 55 imagined cities where the Emperor Kublai Khan summons Marco Polo to tell him what he saw. And Marco Polo proceeds to describe these cities and try to search for or explain what is specific and particular about them and the latent possibilities or potential of every one of these cities. So you might ask, but what does this have to do with branding? Well, clearly branding of cities is important. The words, images, logos, uh, these concepts do matter a great deal, but not without corresponding deeds. In other words, branding is as branding does. It's not a separate exercise or an applique. It's about the vital narrative of a particular city or place that makes it unique and special. You can't just graft a false story or an empty one. We all want to be known in our cities for our assets and successes. And the trick is to find those unique catalytic initiatives which exploit our genius loci, the genius of place, culturally, physically, and socially, and tell our story. And particular cities, as we know, at different times in their evolution, have been able to rise to this challenge and enhance their reputation. So I'm, I'm going to start by what is a common backdrop or a meta story, which is going on in North America now. And it's something I think we're becoming all increasingly aware of. In the last two and a half generations, um, what we have done in, in the generations following World War II is to transform the urban world one way. And we're now in the middle of a reverse transformation reacting to what we did in that first one. And this, this is something that every city, certainly in North America and many other developed cities or in the developed world, uh, across the world, are uh, being caught up in. So the round one in this transformation was the exodus from the city, the flight from the city. And what we saw is a convergence of centrifugal forces, anti-city polemics that particularly arose in Europe in the decades prior to World War II. Uh, cheap energy uh, in 1950, gasoline was uh, 15 cents a gallon in the US. And a whole series of policies that I think you're all familiar with that caused people to begin this mass flight from cities. Uh, here you see a, an image that I got on, online of pre-war Tacoma. I assume a lively and active downtown. Uh, and the 1939 World's Fair, where General Motors had its pavilion and the Futurama pavilion, the world of tomorrow, really were emblematic of this sort of mass euphoria about the potential of the automobile in particular and the possibility of spreading out and leaving the city. Uh, this is really the subject of my book, Walking Home. And I begin the book going through the rings of time through pretty much any city. And I would reckon that you could do the same for your city, where if you start in the pre-war part of the city, the heart of the city, your downtown, for example, you will find uh, an urban fabric that transforms itself extremely easy, easily to the demands of 21st century life 
or connections, proximity, transparency, synergies, all those things that we value now. And as you move out through those rings of time, uh, the streets get wider, the buildings get pushed back, you get shopping plazas, parking lots occupying the sidewalk, and eventually you find yourself in a world where you're not meant to be on foot and where pedestrians are simply not welcome. Um, this dominant paradigm that we all embraced starts testing to failure as quickly as it's created. So here's a Life magazine cover from 1960 pointing out that Eisenhower's interstate highway network is filling up as fast as it's being built. Um, the consequences of what we were doing to the atmosphere did not become clear so quickly, but now we are seeing those um, in climate change very clearly. Uh, we're also experiencing a public health crisis, and increasingly the medical officers of health in various cities have really stepped into the planning arena, pointing out that we have a generation of children uh, with levels of hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, and obesity that we have never seen before through the combination of being driven around everywhere and sitting in front of their screens. And if all that were not enough, uh, fracking notwithstanding, we are understanding the limits to fossil fuel and our ability to continue to rely on that and how that is changing both the economy of our nations and of our households. So round two, which we are now well into, is a delayed aftershock as all the assumptions and underpinnings of that first paradigm start to unravel. And there are a number of big forces that are propelling this second round. They're economic, they're social, they're environmental, but most significantly, it's demographic. And younger generations are voting with their feet in large numbers across North America as they see urban places, not through the lens of ideology, but simply as being more convenient, more satisfying as a place to live. And this, this can be summed up very simply as walkability, if you want to reduce it to one word. So this North American dream, this post-war North American dream that was so ubiquitous, loses its luster. And in fact, a competing dream emerges that reflects this whole new set of priorities for a younger generation. And simply, it's being able to walk to buy your groceries, to use a bicycle, to have access to transit, all those very simple things. So this, this is really showing up on the radar in a very big way. The Urban Land Institute, the ULI, which is probably the most respected organization of developers, uh, published an issue in May of 2013 alerting their members to the fact that what they do as developers should be addressing this new set of preferences and priorities in the American population. Uh, this is from the Wall Street Journal, and what you see here with starting with the baby boomer generation, generation X, generation Y, and now the millennials, is the increasing blue pyramid of people who are choosing to live in a medium or large city, and the key word there is city, which has those attributes of walkability, at the same time the shrinking preference for that first paradigm, North American dream. Uh, this is from the Wall Street Journal. Um, a couple of interesting graphs, one on the left showing what's called demotorization, where the number of vehicle miles traveled annually is actually decreasing in most of the Western world. In fact, what we have reached and are moving past is peak car. On the right, even more interesting, is the propensity to get driver's licenses. So you see two snapshots, 1983 in the light blue and in the dark blue, 2010. And now you can see the difference in those two curves from age 16 to 34, 26% of young North Americans do not have and will not seek to get driver's licenses. Now for my generation, this is amazing. The rite of passage was the moment you turned 16, the first day you could go and take your driver's test and get your driver's lessons, license, that's what we all did. And increasingly now for young Americans, mobility means this. It's not to do with the automobile anymore. Another related phenomenon is the tremendous loss of traditional industry that has occurred 
throughout the country. This happens to be Brooklyn, the port of Brooklyn, where I worked on the Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, but you see these snapshots from the peak industrial era to the piers on the lower right, uh, piers one through six that were virtually abandoned by the New York Port Authority. And I, I have dubbed this phenomenon the retreat of the industrial glacier from our cities, if you think about that image for a moment. But what it has done is create this vast terrain of availability in cities where cities, in fact, are reinventing themselves. And one of the most interesting jobs I got to work on was the Brooklyn Bridge Park. And I don't know if any of you have had the occasion to visit it. Uh, this, this is a remarkable new park occupying all of those piers on the East River, which is echoed by efforts that are happening all around New York Harbor. So what, what we're seeing in, with this retreat of the industrial glacier and putting this together with the shift in paradigm shift is places like this, which is my neighborhood in Toronto, which was an industrial powerhouse in the early 20th century, a warehouse district uh, that was, was producing things for the entire country, uh, which has now become an area of mixed use and what you see in the darker color are all the new buildings, many, many of which are residential, but some are also employment, uh, that are actually infilling this area. And what's fascinating is that there are more people working there now than there were at the height of the industrial era. And you might ask, how could that be? And I, I don't expect you to read the words, but those bar graphs, and these are 400 acres of land, the two shoulders of downtown Toronto, on the far right is the loss of the previous manufacturing jobs and all of those bars rising above the line uh, from moving to the left are new economy jobs of a whole variety of types that have come to fill in. And what's even more fascinating is in downtown Toronto now, 46% of the people who live downtown actually walk to work. So that's not counting cycling, that's not counting transit, that's simply people who live and work in the same neighborhoods as this mixed use development has filled in. So this, let's come back to a phenomenon that I know is of interest to you, applying this meta story, which is the second city phenomenon. And one of my really greatest work experiences has been a 15 year relationship with the city of St. Paul the furthest uh, north of the navigable headwaters of, of the Mississippi, and clearly a second city in relation to Minneapolis, its bigger cousin, 12 miles upriver. Um, so St. Paul really demonstrates this ability of cities to be resilient, to adapt, and to change the course. And what you see here is what ecologists would call the climaxing of the industrial era, the hollowing out of the downtown when I became involved in the mid-1990s with Mayor Norm Coleman. And I've worked with three mayors, interestingly Republicans and Democrats, um, over the course of all these years on a common agenda. So you can see at that point, so many buildings have disappeared. Uh, the parking lots, the city was hemorrhaging, losing population. The lower left is the city's reconception of itself as St. Paul on the Mississippi really re-embasing its relationship with the river. And the lower right, a little microcosm where First Bank, one of the major banks in the city, actually uh, was inspired to donate that triangular lot, which had been a drive-in bank and a parking lot, to the city for a little park symbolizing that reconnection through an international competition to the Mississippi River. So this, this began just before I got there and with George Latimer, who was then the mayor, where Ben Thompson, native son of St. Paul, who was a well-known architect in Boston, he was the one who did Quincy Market, Faneuil Hall, was invited back to do a report. And Ben came back several months later, no report, but he had done this one watercolor, which he called the Great River Park. And if you think of the photographs that I showed you a moment ago, he took extraordinary liberties in reimagining a verdant river valley on the Mississippi River and a St. Paul that embraced its river. And that led to the transformation. Now, it's really important when you do this 
to think of the fourth dimension, to think of the play of time, to understand how you got to where you are now in order to think about how you go forward. So here you see the upper left, the beautiful limestone bluffs on the Mississippi River. At the time, uh, the colonists were settling there. You can see the clearing of the forest, the hardening of the river for the barge fleet, the emptying out of the downtown, and then uh, this effort that I got involved in with Mayor Norm Coleman and continued with Mayor Randy Kelly and Mayor Chris Coleman, which began with a whole series of meetings with the whole community all over town to come up with a kind of constitution, these ten basic principles that may seem obvious, but a lot of hard work went into adopting those principles, and they begin with evoking a sense of place establishing the unique urban ecology, investing in the public realm, broadening the mix of uses, improving connectivity, and so on. And people really bought into these goals. Now, mind you, this is in the mid-1990s. Many of these things have become commonplace now. And this watercolor that you saw briefly really captured that notion of a city that was greener, that was connected, that was repopulated, where the neighborhoods were connected to downtown to each other as an aspiration. And this actually was picked up as a logo by the county, by major corporations on their annual reports. This, this became uh, something that everybody rose to. And it was also then the subject of the development framework that I worked on for a number of years with St. Paul. And the idea was pretty simple and it was expressed in a whole series of different diagrams but it also connected to a bigger regional idea linking St. Paul to Minneapolis and we went back and discovered that the great landscape architect Horace Cleveland at the end of the 19th century had come up with something called the Grand Round which were these great regional trails going through the countryside linking the Twin Cities. We set up an office, and I served for a year as the interim director of the Design Center for St. Paul. That's Tim Griffith, who is the current director. And we convened meetings. We showed all of the new projects that were being created uh, by different people. We brought people together around this goal. And we had all of the city staff who could be in any way called city builders. Um, we gave them all two passports. So one passport was their role in the line functions in their departments, and the second passport was the design center, where they were seconded for a certain number of hours every day to work in a roundtable setting in the storefront office outside City Hall. Uh, we created a program, an incremental program of public realm investment called the Renaissance Project, which you see here, the areas in gray representing where development was going to occur, uh, the greener areas are those elements of investment in the public realm with annual expenditures that is being pursued year after year. This is the park that you saw early, which was very important to have early wins, to have demonstrations of what you're talking about that carry the DNA of the whole project. So this, this is the kind of transformation that has happened in neighborhood in, after neighborhood in St. Paul. This uh, scrapyard on the Mississippi on the upper landing, which was there when I began work, uh, was transformed into uh, a really stunning new neighborhood on the Mississippi River. Um, the whole community got involved in the river valley. 35,000 trees were planted. The number is not that impressive, but what was impressive is the trees were planted by school kids and by employees of all the companies in St. Paul who were given time off to actually take part in this tree planting exercise and all the saplings that were planted were provided so that people can go in the river valley and say, I actually had a hand in planting that tree and could identify very personally with the transformation. So as this has gone on, what's really important is to continually reset the bar. So there is now a new initiative called the Great River Passage, which is one of the newest national parks in the U.S., which will extend all the way from St. Paul to Minneapolis, embracing all of the spaces, some federally owned, some owned by the state, and some municipally owned and privately owned, into this great park that will connect the two cities. And most importantly, is a constant retelling of the story. 
So every year there's an annual gathering. It's called the Miller Fillmore Dinner. It's named after the president who organized a great excursion by train to St. Louis and by paddle boat up the Mississippi River to St. Paul. And there you see in the foreground, in the brown suit, the current mayor of St. Paul, Chris Coleman, 1,200 people get together in the convention center every year to tell stories about what has happened in that year. And they invite people from communities up and down the Mississippi to join them in that storytelling. And this is really what keeps this alive. The Pioneer Press and the Star Tribune uh, have really picked up on this and they show constantly all of these projects that are part of this ongoing story and it's really important to have that outreach to the press. So here, here's a second story and I, I'm going to tell three of these. This is Edmonton, Alberta where I have been working uh, for the city of Edmonton. This is a, again a second city. Uh, Edmonton is second fiddle to Calgary. Edmonton is sort of the rough and tumble tumble blue-collar town uh, supplying the workers in the um, oil sands um, and a lot of the material for that and is really trying to reestablish its identity. And so at the time I got involved there had been a number of these soundings very similar to what had gone on in St. Paul uh, and about anticipating and shaping change. Uh, the way we move, the way we live, the way ahead, etc. All of these were very extensive community exercises. And my task was to work with the staff and to make sense of the many things that were happening in and around downtown, you see here in this pink color, that were all being seen as individual projects without an integrating story tying them together and without a, a big planning idea. So how, how to maximize the benefit of these chess pieces. And so what we created, and I, I worked there alone with the city staff, is a strategy for moving out of silos into a shared dialogue around city transformation through these four lenses. The change in land use, the change in built form, the additions or changes to the public realm, and transportation and infrastructure investments. All of this tied to the themes that had come out of those soundings. And so what this has led to is a form of shared three-dimensional GIS-based modeling that all of the city departments and all of the agencies and all of the private actors will have access to in depicting what exists, but also being able to put everybody's work on the same chessboard, two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally, and see the cumulative impact of all of these changes in forging a vision for the future. So here again from the press in Edmonton, the Edmonton Journal is the kind of story you would like to see. Good decisions transforming Edmonton's most important neighborhood, its downtown, and the celebration of all those efforts. And again, this, this is involved several political administrations. This is not something that happens instantaneously. Third example is St. Louis. Um, and I was fortunate to be on a winning team for uh, an international competition for the transformation of the Jefferson National uh, Expansion Memorial, the very famous arch on the Mississippi that you know by Eero Saarinen and the landscape by Dan Kiley. Uh, which through all of the troubles of St. Louis has remained a very important symbol of the city and we have produced a plan which is being implemented now for the re revitalization of that site, the museum, uh, the very important park and its connections to the downtown. Through the course of that, and this, this is an image of how that edge of the Mississippi River will be transformed, through the course of that the leaders in St. Louis wanted us to get engaged with them in a bigger operation to leverage the benefits of this transformation that was being carried out by the National Park Service of this very important park and monument on the Mississippi River. And so to reach back into the surrounding area to all of the key assets that were themselves 
either already the subject of transformation or were planned for transformation and to come up with a bigger picture engaging more people. And what's interesting here, going back to the theme of walkability that I was talking about, is there, there's a light rail line that runs from the university to the river and across the river in St. Louis. And if you look at those blue um, stripes and the second one in from the left, walk score, what you will see there is for the same reasons, going back to my meta story, the only parts of St. Louis in the downtown area that are experiencing growth are ones that are close to the transit line and ones that have that walkability and Washington Avenue, which is their great warehouse district, which is being transformed. So this, and it's, it's the link to the river. So again, there, there are background elements to this story. While, while the particulars are, com are specific to each place, there's some background elements that are common. So this, this is a, an enormous opportunity on the edge. At the far left there, you can see uh, faded out the monument and, and the, the park for the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial. But this is something called Laclede's Landing, which was a moribund industrial area on the shoulder of that park, linking back to downtown, to the stadium, to a number of assets, to that light rail line. And so we were engaged by all the parties here to look ahead as a microcosm of the bigger story to how the various elements of transformation in this area could add up to more than the sum of their parts. So we brought all the parties together. Uh, we had discussions with them. We did a design exercise with them. We looked at all the critical links and connections and overlaps and opportunities for synergies that could occur within this area. And so really what this is about is building a virtuous circle, which is connected to a new identity. So that having a more vibrant city fabric and public realm contributes to a strong central city brand, relates to having an active precinct. And so City Arch River, which was the organization that was spearheading the transformation of the park and the monument, uh, the M standing for the, the Metro, the Transportation Agency, the National Park Service, uh, Greening the Great River Conservancy, all of these groups became coalition partners as part of this transformation along with many private sector actors in the city. And here again from the St. Louis Dispatch, Dispatch is the story that you're looking for which says that you've achieved a measure of success, the St. Louis Riverfront renovation serves as a shining example of being able to bring people together. So the, these transformative efforts that change a city's image can emerge in many different places. Uh, it's a kind of upstream, downstream phenomena. It comes from elected officials, from civil servants, community groups, individuals, companies, entrepreneurs, developers, planners, design professionals. There's a spectrum that ranges from early adapters and pioneers to resistors and holdouts who come on side eventually. You need the small and agile. You need the big and powerful. What you really need to do is to build the snowball to create a phenomenon that people will join on to and allow that positive momentum to grow to a virtuous circle. Sometimes the leadership comes from somebody like Mike Bloomberg in New York, who is a, a mayor who was a real visionary and engineered a transformation. Sometimes it comes from community groups like this in my city, Toronto, where this group got together and was really responsible for the transformation of an abandoned railway into a really popular rails to trails effort. It's also the accumulation of thousands of individual efforts as small scale investors make investments in the future because they see a big picture that they can relate to. Uh, sometimes it takes pilots to show the possibility, experiments to show the possibility of radical change, like what New York City did with Broadway from 23rd Street up to 59th Street, where in six weeks they transformed Broadway into a largely pedestrian area with temporary landscape, and people were thrilled, and it has now become a permanent feature of the city, and that's Times Square that you see on the left. Uh, this is my city. Um, Young Street, which is our main drag, 
where we simply took a lane of traffic out of a main artery and the businesses experienced a 40% uptake in sales um, during that period, leading to a more permanent transformation. Uh, sometimes it's about bending the trend line and understanding the trend. I'm the master planner for Boston University and this shows when we look back from 1997 to about 2009, what we were really interested to see was that the use of the automobile was declining rapidly and walking and biking and transit were actually gaining. And so the question is, how do you continue to bend that trend line? Occasionally, it's seeing a very big picture, like the Big Dig in Boston. And I was privileged to serve as chief planner in Boston under Tom Menino for a couple of years in the aftermath of the Big Dig. And one of my key tasks was how to leverage that huge investment in transforming the city. So sometimes these very opportunities for these very big moves as mid 20th century infrastructure ages and deteriorates, a lot of these are coming up for reconsideration. Um, it can sometimes involve making the leap from one speeding freight train to another. Uh, one of my colleagues, Chris Turner, who's an energy analyst based in Calgary, has written a great book, which I would really make, recommend to you, called The Leap, How to Survive and Thrive in the Sustainable Economy. And he identifies what he calls the most vital project of the 21st century, which is this shift. And he's writing primarily from an energy perspective. So cities across North America are transforming as this paradigm shift occurs. It's a complex, multi, multifaceted process with many challenges. Some are internal, some are externalities, some are specific reflections of local circumstance, but every case is unique. So rebranding is a reflection of how skillfully cities make this shift. Every city has a unique set of cards to play. It relates to your place in the natural world, your history, your economy, the cultural makeup, the human resources that you have. The trick, the challenge, is to articulate a vision for the future in a rapidly evolving context and provide real evidence of positive change as you, may, as you go forward. The vision thing can be overdone, but it is extremely important to adopt a proactive stance and get ahead of the curve. That's the common feature of all these examples I've shown you. So the question is, where does Tacoma fit in this picture? Thank you very much.